So hello. Uh, when I was submitting the talk, I submitted the abstract uh, about MicroPython and having like a general talk about how it works and uh, what uh, you can do with it. But when the talks, accepted talks were announced, I figured out that Andre, who was speaking earlier, had almost the same talk. So we uh, had a discussion over email. And uh, we somehow decided that he will, de he will do the introduction. And I will focus on the, uh, something I call the funny parts, uh, because we've been uh, developing uh, our hardware project for quite some time already. And we hit some really interesting issues with even more interesting solutions to it. And I would like to tell a little bit more about, about it. So. Uh, just to summarize the previous talk, MicroPython is available from this website. It's a lean and efficient implementation of Python 3 programming language. And it includes a subset of the standard uh, Python library. This is important because uh, uh, you can use what uh, is already there, what's, what you are used to, but not everything is there. Uh, the good thing about it is that uh, what, what's already in there is usually pretty uh, well optimized for the microcontrollers. And uh, also you can use the MicroPython on uh, some constraints, uh, other constrained environments. Uh, also, what we are leveraging a lot in our project is that MicroPython can be used on uh, normal computers as well. So we can build a binary on Windows, Mac, Linux and use it like it was a regular Python. Uh, also, MicroPython is very advanced. It has uh, bleeding edge features from Python 3.5 and uh, soon to be released uh, Python 3.6. And uh, some of them are interactive prompt, REPL, that what uh, Andre was uh, showing you, that you can interactively type into MicroPython to immediately see the results. It has arbitrary precision integers, which is uh, pretty common on, uh, when you are used to scripting languages on a uh, desktop. But it's quite unusual to have it on uh, microcontrollers. That's very good. Also, it has closures, uh, list comprehensions, generators, exceptions, and uh, also asynchronous programming. So basically, all, all advanced features from Python 3. Uh, also, it has been mentioned that MicroPython could be run on several uh, pieces of hardware. The one that started it all was uh, PyBoard. It was this Kickstarter project by Damien. And also recently, there was a collaboration with BBC and uh, Damien's team to create the MicroBit, which is a development board for British uh, children. So they could uh, get used to embedded programming. Uh, when they are like, I think, 11 or 12 years old. Also, there are a lot of uh, ESP8266 boards, like, for example, Node MCU and VT board. This uh, is a very famous platform for Internet of Things, and there was another Kickstarter project which ported uh, MicroPython on these boards. Uh, there will be a workshop on uh, Sunday, so I would recommend you to join it. And there was this uh, company named PyCoin, Py, uh, PyCom, sorry, uh, also mentioned by Andre, and they are making uh, YPy and LowPy boards. And uh, what we are doing, uh, I'm a part of a company called Satoshi Labs, and we are developing Bitcoin-related projects, and one of the famous ones is Trezor, which is a hardware wallet. Uh, I will talk a little bit about our platform and how it affects uh, the development I'll be talking uh, later. So this is how it looks like. It's a uh, universal security token. Basically, if you know security tokens like YubiKey, that's something uh, similar, but it has a display and it's uh, scriptable in Python. Uh, it's the evolution of our older Trezor. And uh, the good thing is that design is really based on PyBoard. So if you are used to playing with PyBoard, it's almost the same design, but with the touch screen. It has the same processor, STM32 uh, F400 5. And uh, this probably doesn't tell you much, but uh, I will go into details. It's 
168 megahertz. It's actually twice as fast as my first computer. Uh, it has uh, one megabyte of flash. Flash is a memory which is inside of the processor, and it's used to store program and data. You can imagine it like a, like a hard drive on your regular computer, but the difference between a hard drive on your computer and the flash storage in a microcontroller is that microcontroller can run code directly from flash. So if you have like a regular PC and you have uh, some program, first it needs to be loaded from hard drive to memory, and then it could be run. In microcontrollers, they, could, they can run code from flash and from the RAM. That will be very important later. And it has 199 kilobytes of RAM. It, it's not too much, but some older computers, they had like 32 kilobytes, and we spend a lot of uh, hours playing some cool games on it. So it's, uh, it's, not, you know, it's not enough sometimes, but for most of the applications, it's pretty fine. It has a micro SD card slot, same as a um, Pi board. And it has a colorful display with capacitive touch. It's uh, 240 by 240 pixels in 60-bit colors. This is how it looks from the back side. It's, you, as you can see, it's very, very similar to Pi board uh, when it comes to the components, but the layout is, of course, different. And there is a demo how, how user interface could, could look like on the front, front side. Uh, so how we got to the point where we started developing Trezor 2? So first, we had Trezor 1. Uh, and as a, every hardware, it has a firmware. And usually, you start writing firmware in C. So we had a pretty huge code base, uh, including some event handling and business logic. Everything was written in C. And then it started to get messy, like you are uh, processing some uh, cryptographic uh, stuff. And then a uh, then, uh, uh, computer decides to ask, hey, what is your USB hit descriptor? And then you have to answer like in a couple of hundred milliseconds, because otherwise the communication will stop. So there were a lot of uh, interrupts and stuff you usually hate uh, doing when you are doing embedded programming. And also, it was a problem that all this business logic, which is usually high level, like take this message, uh, concatenate, concatenate it with this message and tie them together and return the signature to computer. It was also written in C and even the most uh, easy tasks started to get a lot, of, a lot of lines of code and it was very easy to make mistakes. So we had a lot of existing low-level code in C, like device drivers and crypto libraries and so on. And like I said, uh, it was very easy to uh, introduce bugs in this uh, business application code, and it was not very accessible. Like, uh, we tried to focus on Bitcoin, but from time to time there were people like, hey, I'm uh, developing this alternative coin, please add support to Trezor, and we were like, sorry, we don't have resources for that, but you can uh, study the source code and add it yourself. But it was basically like saying, uh, you know, a few, because it was very hard for uh, normal folks to understand the embedded C code. Uh, so that's why we thought uh, MicroPython seemed like a very ideal choice for version 2 firmware, because we could reuse existing low level code. And these external people, which are usually skilled in some high level language like JavaScript and Python, could finally write application code for such uh, low-level uh, device like security token. So how are we going to use this uh, low-level C code in MicroPython? Uh, or, or when? Uh, we usually want to use this low-level C code when uh, performance is critical for some reason. If I write uh, crypto, uh, crypto functions in Python, it takes like one minute. 
but usually people don't want to uh, don't want to keep waiting one minute for uh, GPG to sign their message. They want to have it signed like immediately. Otherwise, they won't use it. So that's why you want to have it in uh, some low-level fast code. Uh, also, it's useful when you want to or when you need to reuse existing code. I, I don't want to spend another uh, half a year rewriting all uh, libraries for working with display and, uh, and other stuff. And also, it's useful when uh, we, you need low-level access to, to the hardware. So how does it work in MicroPython? Uh, it's C language, what you are going to see. How many of you have some experience with C? Okay. Oh, almost everyone, cool. I hadn't expected it. So uh, that's how a native module looks like in MicroPython. So basically, you design some, uh, this, uh, create some function, which uh, has some MP ob ob object T uh, arguments. Uh, this is something like abstraction class that uh, can hold any Python object. And this function returns another Python object, or MicroPython object. Then uh, you basically process these arguments. Uh, in, in the, really, uh, you should handle like what, what type is interested, interesting for you. Uh, I would like to design this function in a way that it uh, is uh, accepting strings or bytes. And uh, how does it work in MicroPython? You have a structure MP buffer. And what you do is you use this fu function, MP get buffer race. And what it does, it looks into this object, uh, argument one, and tries to uh, access it as a, as a buffer. For MicroPython, buffer is a string or bytes. And uh, copies the data to this buffer infrastructure. Uh, we just need the read access, so we are using this constant. And this race here means that if for some reason this object is not string, but maybe integer, whatever, it will raise an exception. So it's pretty, even though it's C, it's still pretty high level. Uh, if we are about to Except integers, I would, uh, wouldn't use this function, but there would be uh, like uh, mp jet int or mp get uh, int class. So that's uh, basically how I convert these uh, high level MicroPython objects into C structures or C variables. And then I will perform uh, some action with them using like a regular C programming. So first, I compare if they are the same length, and if they are the same length, I will check if they have the same contents, and if these both conditions are met, I return MP const true, which is again some uh, MicroPython object which encapsulates the Boolean value of true, and otherwise I will return false. And uh, if I have uh, uh, several functions like this, I can create a native module, and uh, this module is the, then available from MicroPython like it was uh, regularly written in Python, but actually it's written in C. And I forgot another thing. This is, again, some MicroPython magic. But basically what it says is that this function uh, always takes two objects as parameters. Uh, here you can, uh, you can have different macros which say, like, uh, this ha can have from two up to seven parameters, and it can also define some uh, keyword arguments and so on. So in, uh, our, during our development, we created several modules like this. Uh, Trezor.config is a key value storage for uh, storing non-volatile data. That means uh, you, you want to keep some data stored in the microcontroller even when it, uh, it's unplugged from the computer. Uh, for example, private keys, you wouldn't be very happy if they were lost when you unplug it. Then we have a lot of uh, crypto algorithms, like symmetric and asymmetric ciphers, hashing and uh, key stretching. This is, again, written in C because of the performance. We have some debugging modules for reading uh, memory. This is, of course, just for debugging, not, from, not for production. And 
Also, we have a UI library for uh, graphics. Uh, another thing we are using is something called frozen modules. On uh, MicroPython or embedded development, uh, you have a problem that if you have a Python code, you first have to load it into memory and then process by the interpreter, which again uses some memory and uh, also it takes some time. But the problem is if the code is really big and our code base is getting really big, it may not even fit in the memory. Like there is 192 uh, kilobytes, but it's, sometimes it's not enough. So what you can do is uh, MicroPython he has a cross compiler called MPyCross, and what it does is it goes through the, your Python sources and creates something like portable bytecode. It's not portable like you can take it from MicroPython and use it in Python 3, but you can use it in various MicroPython ports like on a desktop, on a, a ARM, or other platforms. Then there is a, a MPI tool which collects these uh, MicroPython bytecode files, and it creates one C file which is called frozen underscore MPI. And this is then compiled, and it becomes a part of the firmware image. So basically, we can take all our Python source code, and it will become a part of one firmware which is loaded uh, in the device. And then it doesn't take almost uh, no memory, because uh, you don't have to parse it, you don't have to load it into memory, you don't have to translate it into bytecode. And you can read it directly from this flash, like I mentioned earlier. So processor can read it directly. And uh, it doesn't take uh, almost any, any memory. For example, we have uh, this event loop, which is around 5,000 bytes. When it's uh, translated into bytecode, it's again almost the same size. And then uh, frozen MPI uh, is... Uh, almost 10, 10 times the size, but it really doesn't matter because it's auto-generated code uh, in C, and when it's compiled, it's uh, around this twice size the original, but you have really this benefit that it doesn't run from memory, it runs from flash. Uh, what we do in uh, our development cycle is, uh, like I mentioned, this application code for our Trezor is written in Python uh, or in MicroPython, and this can be run on different ports. So the same application code is able to be run on desktop and on the hardware itself. So uh, during the development cycle, we use REPL for prototyping. Like we have all these uh, native modules, and we can uh, use uh, this uh, basically Python just to gl glue the stuff together and see if it works. And if it works, then we will write modules in, in files and test it on desktop in the emulator. Uh, we, we call it emulator, but basically it's just the MicroPython build for uh, Unix, which runs the same code. Then when we are satisfied with the Python code, we copy it to the SD card and uh, test it on the real hardware. So hardware will read this Python code, uh, do the stuff. We see that we got all the constants right, like uh, speed, speed of uh, animations, or that uh, a computation doesn't take long. If it does take long time, then we probably think of, have to think, what about uh, if we have written this function from Python to C? But uh, usually that's not needed, fortunately. And when we are satisfied with the result, we can uh, freeze the module into the C code and uh, basically reduce the memory needed for uh, running this application. So uh, during the development also, we developed some usage tricks, memory usage tricks. So imagine we have this uh, nice picture on the left, and we want to show it on, uh, on the device itself. The thing is, uh, the board has just uh, limited memory, and on a Unix port, it really doesn't have limited memory, or it, it does to one megabyte, but still it's 10 times bigger as uh, the real hardware. So what you can do is 
you run MicroPython with this option, minus x heap size 100,000, and this interpreter on uh, desktop uh, has a limited set of memory, and you can immediately see that if uh, some application breaks on your desktop, it will also break on the hardware, or the vice versa. Uh, before we discovered this option, we had this problem that uh, the software ran without problems on desktop, but when we put it on the real hardware, we had these problems. Yeah, like I said, the default is one megabyte. So, uh, because of this image uh, limitations, we, uh, we created an optimized image format. Uh, just shortly, uh, we have a 16-bit uh, display, so we don't have to use 24 or 32 bits from PNGs. And also, we have a much simpler header. We don't need uh, all this uh, complex stuff from PNG. So we have just image di dimensions and compressed data si size. And we use the same compression as PNG in this our format. So the original PNG, you've seen, it, it's almost 100 kilobytes. And our uh, optimized file is uh, almost 40% smaller. So it's like six, 60, 60 kilobytes. So I just upload this file onto the SD card and let's display it on display. Uh, let's import a, a MicroPython port of uh, Zlip library. Let's open the file. Let's uncompress it. And we have a memory allocation error. Why? Because the f first line with the data equals something, it consumed 60 kilobytes of memory. And then the output consumed another 115 kilobytes of memory, and we simply don't have this much. So what do we do? Let's store the image resource as bytes, variable, in a frozen module. Like I said, uh, microcontroller can read it directly from the flash, so it's not read from the memory. And if we uh, decompress the stuff, let's not decompress the image into the main memory of the microcontroller, but the display has its own memory, so let's use the generator, and it can write it directly into the display memory. So in the main memory of the microcontroller, we just use uh, several hundred bytes just for this small decompression buffer. And uh, it's, it's a constant memory usage, so it, it doesn't really matter how big the image is. Uh, another cool trick uh, we are using is something called unimport. So firmware is usually composed of many different applications, and they usually don't run at the same time. Either I am doing something with bitcoins, or I am uh, signing some GPG messages, or I am doing something else, but I really don't do everything at the same time. So it's really impractical to keep all the imported modules in the memory. So what's a really cool solution is let's use just the local imports. So basically, we import modules inside of the function. And using the unimport decorator, we will sweep them after the function is exited. So uh, these modules can be freed. And uh, this, uh, this uh, decorator, what it does before the function is started, it will record the set of modules that are being used. It's in sys.modules. And then after the function is uh, finished, it will compare which uh, modules were added. It will remove the references from sys.modules and calls gc.collect and basically freeze all the modules that are not in needed anymore. Uh, also, we are using protocol buffers for communication, and there are various options how to use it. So C is very fast, but it's inflexible because it doesn't have the dynamic definitions. There is an official Python uh, port of uh, Google uh, of uh, protocol buffers by Google. It has a lot of features, but it's really huge. So uh, we made a async kernel sprout of buff codec in something like 200 lines of code. And it supports the subset we use. And it's also heavily optimized. And uh, applications can easily register their messages. So it's dynamic. It's not static like a C, C code. Uh, another feature we use is asynchronous programming. 
which uh, is really nice. Uh, we do not have hardware threads on uh, the device yet, but we still uh, need some concurrency. Uh, why? Because if you are writing complex code of a state machine, uh, it can get get really really messy, and blocking style of writing code feels really natural. And MicroPython supports this uh, syntax from Python 3.5, so why not use it? But again, there is a async IO library, which is really cool, don't get me wrong, but it's really big for, for microcontrollers. So again, we made an even loop with blocking and uh, blocking on events and complex task management. Again, it's around 200 lines of code. I really think that if you have a module that is bigger, then you are probably doing something wrong. So uh, just a quick example how it looks like. We define this uh, color change function, uh, which is asynchronous, and uh, it uses the method from our event loop. And basically, uh, it will spawn two functions, color click and color after, and awaits the result. And what, uh, what the event loop does, it schedules some uh, magic behind the scenes, but if you are looking at it from, from the high-level point of view, it really seemed like these two functions are running in parallel. But of course they aren't. They are just scheduled to be, to be run. And this color click function basically is again using asynchronous mechanism to wait for an event. This event is emitted when you touch and raise the finger from the display. And it if it uh, happens, it will change the color of the display to red. And again, uh, color after function, it will wait for a given number of seconds, and it will change the color to blue. So basically what happens now is uh, when you first touch the display, it will change the color to red. Uh, but if you haven't touched the display for 10 seconds, it will change the color to blue. And this type of... Uh, uh, programming seems very natural because uh, you can read uh, the code like it was a story. But uh, if I was writing this in C, it would be like really, really messy, especially when there are some other external stuff uh, coming from the outside. It's very easy to handle it. So I, I will skip this because we don't have a lot of time. And but the, if, if I will give you a link to the slides at the end, but this is how we write the application. So basically, we uh, have something like event events driven loop. So we just wait for some procedure until it finishes. Then we await uh, await a user interaction, and then we just uh, do some stuff. So what I was about to say in one word that lazy approach is really cool. Be lazy. Use generators when possible. And have understanding how software and how hardware work under the hood, because uh, if you know it, you can optimize. Uh, there is a really good uh, example. Uh, this is a uh, list comprehension in Python, which will generate uh, uh, how it's called? It's x to the power of 2 uh, for all numbers from 0 to almost 1 million. But again, if you run this on MicroPython, it will give you out of memory exception. But what you can do, you just replace the brackets uh, with the rounded brackets, and now the list comprehension becomes a generator and it can generate. Uh, generate all, all the range you need, again, with constant uh, memory usage. So stream all the things. Stream is your friend. And on embedded development, it's especially a good, good thing to use. So are there any questions? And before I give you uh, option to ask me. I would like to say that there will be MicroPython workshop with uh, Peter on Sunday, and uh, you can try uh, using MicroPython on these uh, wireless boards. Uh, he, I think he has Node MCUs, and I have uh, VT boards, so please join us. Thanks. Thank you.